set of hymns today, but they were all very beautiful. Um, welcome to Poetry on the Patio. Um, we have a fairly good day today. Um, as you know, well, this is our ninth annual Poetry on the Patio, and we've only been driven inside once because of weather. Um, so I'm very happy that we're able to be out outside today. I'm Dan Jelton, director of the University Libraries. Um, to say a couple words about what we're doing um, here today, this is, uh, as you know, we're National Poetry Month is winding down. It's the month of April. And um, uh, in 1998, inspired by the then U U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky, uh, we began this reading. Uh, Pinsky started something called the Favorite Poem Project, where where people, um, regular people, uh, get together and, and read poems that were important to them um, uh, in, in a group, read them out loud. Um, and I, I love that idea. Um, I think poetry is, um, is both important and, um, and, and especially interesting to, to, to recite rather than sitting in your room uh, uh, by yourself reading it. Um, so since uh, 1998, we've had over 100 uh, members of the University of St. Thomas community come up and, and, and read a poem. I'm very proud of that. Next year is going to be our 10th anniversary, and we're going to, uh, actually, we're working on, uh, even now, compiling the list of all the poems that everybody has read. Um, and it's a really good and interesting list. It'll be sort of like an anthology. Um, we've had a few poems read a couple of times, but not very many. And there have been some that, like, I thought, this, this is going to be read every year, and it hasn't, you know, there's one in particular I have in mind. I won't tell you what it is. That's never been read. Um, uh, so uh, I want to thank Julie Kimlinger, who spends a whole year assembling this roster of readers, and it takes a long time to do that because everybody's favorite time to read is next year. And they're like, yeah, call me next year. I'll, I'm sure I'll do it then. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, th the way the the way the day works is that that we do not uh, we don't say well you have to read a good poem you know or you have to read like a smart poem or a pretty poem or something we don't say anything about uh, what you read other than that it's not one that you wrote this is about uh, reading poetry by others uh, and so as I often say this is a kind of a potluck you know where you don't know if you're going to get all vegetables or all salads or all jello or what it you know but they, the potluck always seems to work out and that's the way that's the way the um our poetry reading has um has has worked out as well it, uh, we always have a really interesting um a list of poems so i was going to i just wanted to quote one of my favorite poem uh poets is mary oliver and um I just wanted to uh, quote something that she said about reading uh, poetry out, out loud. She says, the poem is meant to be given away, best of all by the spoken presentation of it, then the work is complete. Um, and so that's why we are doing this today. Uh, the, way the, the way the day works is you've got the, a copy of the program in your hands. Um, uh, so when uh, the previous reader is done, come on up. Tell us who you are, what you do here, and then if you'd like, say a little bit about the poem that you're going to read uh, and why it's um, special to you. I'll begin. I'm the only person who's read every single year. It's one of the perks of my job. I, otherwise, we don't, like, we don't do a whole lot of, uh, we don't let people double up too often. It's happened, but um, I love this day. This is one of my, f my favorite days of the year. I'm going to read a poem today um, by uh, uh, a Minnesota poet named Joyce Sutton. I hope some of you are familiar with her. She teaches English down at Gustavus, and, and um, I actually met her in Ireland. Um, we were at uh, the Yates International Summer School at the same time uh, many years ago. I, I admire her poetry. The poem uh, uh, that I'm going to read is called This Body, and I, I would simply say that um, my body and I have had uh, an adventure in the last uh, eight or nine months that uh, finally kind of pulling out of, so this one has some s uh, specific meaning for me. Uh, this Body, this comes from Joyce's book Naming the Stars. When I stepped ashore in this body, I was recognized at once and given a name. My bones were smaller, but the shape of the cheek and the chin are the same. This is the only body I know. This color my eyes, this color my skin. Every scar is mine. 
I have become as tall, as slim, as old as I am. My voice has carried the weight of what I had to say. Words were scattered along the way. Words on gravel roads, in hallways and staircases. Words on a wire. Somewhere in a field, my hair. Somewhere in a lake, my skin. Some rooftop where my gaze rested. Some star, a wish. This is my address on earth. Temporary, fragile, a name in the phone book. At the moment, alive. My name is Ben Nebo, and I'm a student here at St. Thomas. And I will be reading a poem called Somebody Blew Up America. Now, this poem is very controversial. It was written after 9-11, and it is an inquiry into what we consider terrorism, what we consider to be terror. And imperialism, quote, is tied into terrorism. And we are, this author, Amir Baraka, he's a professor at Princeton, um, talks about what terrorism our country and all other imperialist countries have done to other countries. And so we should also in internalize what we do as a nation and see how that might be terrorist, terrorist towards other people. So here it goes. I apologize for any controversial um, words said in the poem, but it's, it's an art. So here we go. Somebody blew up America. All thinking people oppose terrorism, both domestic and international. But one should not be used to cover up the other. They say it's some terrorist, some barbaric Arab in Afghanistan. It wasn't our American terrorist. It wasn't the Klan or the skinheads or the them that blows up nigger churches or in reincar reincarcerates us in death row. It wasn't Trent Lott or David Duke or Giuliani or Schindler. Hellman's retiring. It wasn't the gonorrhea in costume, the white sheet diseases that have murdered black people, terrorized reason and insanity, most of humanity as they please is. They say, who say? Who do the saying? Who is them paying? Who tell the lies? Who in the skies? Who had the slaves? Who got the bucks out the bucks? Who got fat from plantations? Who genocided Indians? Tried to waste a black nation? Who live on Wall Street, the first plantation? Who cut your nuts off? Who raped your ma? Who lynched your pa? Who got the tar? Who got the feathers? Who had the match? Who set the fires? Who killed and hired? Who saved the God and still be the devil? Who the biggest only? Who the most goodest? Who did Jesus resemble? Who created everything? Who the smartest? Who the greatest? Who the richest? Who say you ugly and they the good lookingest? Who define art? Who define science? Who made the bombs? Who made the guns? Who bought the slaves? Who sold them? Who called you them names? Who say Domhar wasn't insane? Who, who, who? Who stole Puerto Rico? Who stole the Indies, the Philippines, Manhattan, Australia, the Harbies? Who forced opium on the Chinese? Who owned them buildings? Who got the money? Who think you funny? Who locked you up? Who owned the papers? Who owned the slave ship? Who run the army? Who fake, who the fake president? Who the ruler? Who the banker? Who, who, who? Who own the mine? Who twist your mind? Who got bread? Who need peace? Who you think need war? Who own the oil? Who do no toil? Who own the soil? Who is not a nigger? Who is so great? Ain't nobody bigger. Who own this city? Who own the air? Who own the water? Who own your crib? Who rob and steal and, and cheat and murder and make lies the truth? Who call you uncouth? Who live in the biggest house? Who do the biggest crime? Who go on vacation anytime? Who kill the most niggers? Who kill the most Jews? Who kill the most Italians? Who kill the most Irish? Who kill the most Africans? Who kill the most J Japanese? Who kill the most Latinos? Who, who, who? Who own the ocean? Who own the airplanes? Who own the malls? Who own the television? Who own radio? Who, who own what ain't even been own, who own the owners that ain't the real owners, who own the suburbs, who suck the cities, who make the laws, who made Bush president, who believe the Confederate flag need to be flying, who talk about democracy and be lying, who, 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 
who the beast in Revelations, who 666, who decide Jesus get crucified, who the devil on the real side, who got rich from, that, from the Armenian genocide, who the biggest terrorist, who changed the Bible, who killed the most people, who do the most evil, who don't worry about survival, who have the colonies, who stole the most land, who ruled the world, who say they good but only do evil, who the biggest executioner, who, 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 who own the oil, who want more oil, oil, who told you what you think that later you find out a lie, who, 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 who fought Bin Laden, maybe they Satan, who paid the CIA, who know the bomb was gonna blow, who know why the terrorists learned to fly in Florida, San Diego, who know why five Israelis were filming the explosions and cracking their sides at the notion, who need fossil fuel when the sun ain't going nowhere, who make the credit cards, who get the biggest tax cut, who walked out on the conference against racism, who killed Malcolm, Kennedy, and his brother, who killed Dr. King, who would want such a thing? Are they linked to the murder of Lincoln? Who invaded Grenada? Who made money from apartheid? Who keep the Irish a colony? Who overthrow Chile and Nicaragua? Who killed David Sambinko, Chris Hanai? Who s the same ones who killed Binko, Kabbalah, Narunda, Allende, Che Guevara, Sandino? Who killed Kabbalah? Who knows who the ones who wasted Lombada, Malande, Betsy Sabaz, Princess Margaret, Ralph Featherstone, Little Bobby? Who locked up? Who locked up Mandela, Daramba, Gramano, Ashata, Mo Momina, Garvey, Dashiel, Hamat, Alpha Huto? Who killed the H Huey Newton? Fred Hampton, Margaret Ayres, Mikey Smith, Walter Rundi? Was it the ones who tried to poison Fidel? Who tried to keep the Vietnamese oppressed? Who put the price on Lenin's head? Who put the Jews in ovens? Who helped them do it? Who said, America first? and okay, the yellow stars. Who, who, who? Who killed Rosa Luxemburg, life chicks, who murdered the Rosenbergs, all the, and all the good people, iced, tortured, assassined, vanished? Who got rich from Algeria, Libya, Haiti, Iran, Iraq, Saudi, Kuwait, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine? Why cut off people, who cut off people's hands in the Congo? Who invented AIDS? Who put the germs in the Indians' blankets? Who thought up the Trail of Tears? Who blew up the Maine? Who started the Spanish-American War? Who got Sharon back in power? Who backed Batista, Hitler, Bilbo, Chiang Kai-shek? Who, who, who? Who decided affirmative action had to go? Reconstruction, the New Deal, the New Frontier, the Great Society? Who do Tom Ass Clarence work for? Who do do come out of Co Colin's mouth? Who know what kind of skeezer is a, is a Connellisa? Who paid Connelly to, to, to be a wooden Negro? Who gives genius awards to homo locus sub subsidiaries? Who overthrew Norcom Bishop? Who poisoned R Robeson? Who tried to put the boys in jail? Who framed and raped Jamal Amin? Who framed the Rosenbergs, Garvey, the Scottsboro boys, the Hollywood 10? Who set the rice tr stag on fire? Who knew the World Trade Center was gonna get bombed? Who told 4,000 Israeli workers at the Twin Towers to stay home that day? Why did Sharon stay away? Who, who, who? Explosion of all the newspapers say the devil could be seen. Who, who, who? Who make money from war? Who make dough from fear and lies? Who want the world like it is? Who want the world to be ruled by imperialism and national oppression and terror, violence, hunger, and poverty? Who is the ruler of hell? Who is the most powerful? Who you know ever seen God? But everybody's seen the devil. Like an owl exploding, like your life in your brain, in yourself, like an owl who know the devil, all night, all day, if you listen. Like an owl exploding in fire, we hear the question rise in terrible flame. Like the whistle of a crazy dog, like the acid vomit of a fire of hell. Who, 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 and who?
I'm Paul Strickland. I work in the Career Development Center with uh, students and alumni. Uh, and uh, the poem I picked is uh, one by Robert Bly. Uh, it's, it's called One Source of Bad Information. Uh, all right. There's a boy in you about three years old who hasn't learned a thing for 30,000 years. Sometimes it's a girl. This child had to make up its mind how to save you from death. He said things like, stay home, avoid elevators, eat only elk. You live with this child, but you don't know it. You're in the office, yes, but live with this boy at night. He's uninformed, but he does want to save your life. And he has. Because of this boy, you survived a lot. He's got six big ideas. Five don't work. Right now, he's repeating them to you. Well, as a former psychology, theology, biology person, um, I want to talk about perception. Some people are very familiar with the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken, but in order to really truly understand this poem, one has to understand the term perception. What it means to perceive is to actually be within the mind of the narrator and to understand how the narrator reads something is to understand the purpose for which it is being read. Having said so, I first came across this poem during my freshman year of high school when my mom was first diagnosed with cancer and my dad decided he no longer wanted to be a father of seven children. Thus, I started working. And then as I got into my senior year of, of high school, I got accepted into a college program where I would graduate with 12 credits of college education. My mom had a mental breakdown due to the medication she was taking. So on December 18, 2000, I dropped out of high school and started working full time and had a GED completed within 30 days of that time of leaving high school. I remember what my chemistry teacher said to me. You have been gone for 13 days. You came back and aced my exam. Why are you dropping out? I said there are four loads of laundry that need to be done, a mom's medication that needed to be picked up, a little brother who had to be at school at 10.30 and picked up at 3.30, and a job to work 40 hours a week. And so when I think of the road less traveled, I started that senior year thinking that I'd be walking across the stage wearing my white cap and gown, graduating with my 12 credits of College of Education, and instead, I learned what it meant to be a mom and to take care of a mom. And now I'm here and I'm quite thankful for those experiences. And I truly, really fully understand the road not taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And I'm sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could. To where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay and leaves no step had trotten back. Oh, I kept the first for another day, and yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The next poem I'm going to read is by Emily Dickinson. I wrote my first short story at the age of nine, which I was very happy with because my teacher decided to devote the whole day to me reading my story, which was about two twins who ran away from slavery and was taken in by a voodoo priestess. And so, here it is, I Dwell in Possibility, a story about writing, about how words create an image that you just can't paint, or, and I'm not trying to hit on all the arts, but when you're on your deathbed, there's just something about the words that you remember. 
And this is truly a great portrait of Emily Dickinson. I dwell in possibility, a fairer house in prose, more numerous the windows, superior for doors, as chambers as cedars, impregnable of eye, for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky. O oh, visitors of Ferris, for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bertie Ramacher, and I work in the Wellness Center as the health ed educator. And I'm reading In Sweet Company by Margaret Wolf, which is actually a poem that's in the front of the book entitled In Sweet Company. And she went and interviewed uh, women ar around the United States, and this is a collection of their inspiring stories. And I'm reading it because I think, in essence, it's what a beautiful friendship is. In Sweet Company by Margaret Wolf. We sit together and I tell you things, silent, unborn, naked things, that only my God has heard me say. You do not cluck your tongue at me or roll your eyes or split my heart into a thousand, thousand pieces with words that have little to do with me. You do not turn away because you cannot bear to see your own unclaimed light shining in my eyes. You stay with me in the dark. You urge me into being. You make room in your heart for my voice. You rejoice in my joy. And through it all, you stand unbound by everything but the still, small voice within you. I see my future self in you, just enough to risk moving beyond the familiar, just enough to leave the familiar in the past where it belongs. I breathe you in, and I breathe you out in one luxurious, contented sigh. In sweet company, I am home at last. Hi, I'm Susan Spray, and I work in Corporate Foundation Relations here at the University. Uh, my reading today is by the poet uh, Billy Collins, who was the nation's poet laureate, laureate uh, in 2001 and again in 2002. He was also named New York State Poet Laureate in 2004 and 6. He has won numerous awards and appeared in many uh, magazines, including non-poetry magazines such as Harper's and The New Yorker that include other writings. He was the inaugural recipient of the Poetry Foundation's Mark Twain Award for Humor and Poetry, and he is currently a distinguished, distinguished professor of English at Lehman College, the City University of New York, uh, where he's been teaching for 30 years. Uh, some of you may have heard him on the Prairie Home Companion, where he has been a guest uh, more than once. My poem today is reading an anthology of Chinese poems of the Song Dynasty I pause to admire the length and clarity of their titles. <laughs> my selection is based on my own recent study of Chinese culture and art as a tour guide at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And it was actually the reason I got involved as a volunteer at uh, the MIA, uh, because I've been a, a real uh, devotee of Chinese uh, culture and art most of my life. Reading an anthology of Chinese poems of the Song Dynasty I pause to admire the length and clarity of their titles by Billy Collins. It seems these poets have nothing up their ample sleeves. They turn over so many cards so early, telling us before the first line, whether it is wet or dry, night or day, the season the man is standing in, even how much he has had to drink. Maybe it is autumn and he is looking at a sparrow. Maybe it is snowing on a town with a beautiful name. Viewing peonies at the Temple of Good Fortune on a cloudy afternoon is one of Sung Tung Po's. Dipping water from the river and simmering tea is another one, or just on a boat awake at night. And Lu Yu takes the simple rice cake with, in a boat on a summer evening, I heard the cry of a water bird. It was very sad, 
and seemed to be saying, my woman is cruel. Moved, I wrote this poem. There is no iron turnstile to push against here, as with headings like Vortex on a String, The Horn of Neuroses, or whatever. No confusingly inscribed welcome mat to puzzle over. Instead, I walk out on a summer morning to the sound of birds and a waterfall. It's a beaded curtain brushing over my shoulders. And 10 days of spring rain have kept me indoors is a servant who shows me into the room where a poet with a thin beard is sitting on a map with a jug of wine, whispering something about clouds and cold wind, about sickness and the loss of friends. How easy he has made it for me to enter here, to sit down in a corner, cross my legs like his, and listen. My name's Corinne Carvalho. I'm a professor of theology, um, <laughs> scripture in fact, and um, also the director of the Luann Demmer Center for Women. The poem that I've picked is by Alicia Aust Ostricker, and um, she has written 11 books of poetry, but she's also written a couple of books of biblical interpretation. Um, and I chose the poem because of the combination of um, women's issues re and religion in this poem. And it's pretty brief, but it's called Every Woman Her Own Theology. I'm nailing them up to the cathedral door. Like Martin Luther. Actually, no. I don't want to resemble that schmutzkopf. See Eric Erickson and N.O. Brown on the reformers and aberrations, not to mention his hatred of Jews and peasants. So I'm thumbtacking these 95 theses to the bulletin board in my kitchen. My proposals or should I say requirements, include at least one image of a god, virile, beard optional, one of a goddess, nubile, breast size approximating mine, one divine baby, one lion, one lamb, all nude as figs, all dancing wildly, all shining, reproducible, in marble, metal, in fact, any material. Ethically, I am looking for an absolute endorsement of loving kindness. No loopholes, except maybe mosquitoes. <laughs> Virtue and sin will henceforth be discouraged, along with suffering and martyrdom. There will be no concept of infidels. Consequently, the faithful must entertain themselves some other way than killing infidels, and so forth and so on. I understand this piece of paper is going to be spattered with wine one night at a party and covered over with newer pieces of paper. That's how it goes with bulletin boards. Nevertheless, it will be there, like an invitation, like a chalk pentagle. It will emanate certain occult vibrations. If something sacred wants to swoop from the universe through a ceiling and materialize, folding its silver wings in a kitchen and bump its chest against mine, my paper will tell this being where to find me. I'm Megan Davey. I'm a sophomore at St. Thomas, um, a journalism and English major. And I'm reading Dirge Without Music by Edna St. Vincent Millay. And the first time I came across this poem was in one of my favorite books, um, Baby, by Patricia McLaughlin. And it's the story of a family that's grappling with the death of their young child. And um, this poem is read by one of the characters during that period or moment of struggle between understanding the death of the child and anger and indignation over why this life was taken. And I think every person who cares or loves about any loves anyone else experiences this at some point in their life. And so I think this poem is very applicable and it captures that moment very succinctly. So this is Dirge Without Music. I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the hard ground. So it is and so it will be, for so it has been, time out of mind. Into the darkness they go, the wise and the lovely, Crowned with lilies and with laurel they go, but I am not resigned. 
Lovers and thinkers into the earth with you. Be one with the dull, the indiscriminate dust. A fragment of what you felt, of what you knew. A formula, a phrase remains, but the best is lost. The answer is quick and keen, the honest look, the laughter, the love. They are gone. They are gone to feed the roses. Elegant and curled is the blossom, fragrant blossom, I know, but I do not approve. More precious was the light in your eyes than all the roses in the world. Down, down, down into the darkness of the grave. Gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know, but I do not approve, and I am not resigned. Thank you. I'm C.B. Rick, and Rick clearly labeled, uh, one of the three janitors at Morrison Hall. Is, am I speaking plainly? It would be comforting to know that I am. Um, my poet is George Cabot Lodge. I don't think that I would have heard of him or turned to him if I hadn't published him 30 years ago in, in the course of a, a project I had to ease my withdrawal from my old profession, which was academic publishing. Um, Lodge fits in between the two Henrys, if you remember how they are. The, the Lodge were the extreme blue bloods in in Boston. He's kind of the black hole in the family because he was the black sheep. So wherever you find the lodges discussed, uh, you will find a good deal of material about Henry the first, George's father, Henry the second, his son, but nothing at all about George. It just sort of skipped blithely over the man in the middle. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, there's a lot of sophomoric junk in, in what he wrote, but some of it is really quite, I is really okay, I think. I'm going to read two sonnets from uh, the collection called The Great Adventure, which was published in 04, I think. Yes, 04. This is, uh, the, this is one called Death. He wrote uh, quite a number of sonnets about death. This is Death One. The house of life has many mansions where, like men, dream haunted in unquiet sleep. We seek and strive and suffer, laugh and weep and fear the truth and mask the soul's despair. And much in festival, and much in prayer, and sorrow, and hysteric thanksgivings, and more in labor for little and low things, our life's brief interval is wasted there. And only when magnificently someone, of all the dreaming myriads, patiently shapes the great key and slants the secret door, as he departs we feel the blinding sun, the pealing song, and know his soul is free, bound in the dream of life and death no more. And on a lighter note, this is, I'm going to read something shorter than what I originally intended. It's actually a better poem. It's called Life. This is Life Nine, about Tuckanuck, because Lodge had his best times at the beach. We loved too perfectly for praise the spread of noon's sun-startled sea. We loved the large tranquility of flowing distances and days. In calm, dark sunsets or the blaze of moonlit waves, the ecstasy and spacious thought of liberty thrilled us in deep and silent ways. We loved too much for song or speech, the stars' exalted loneliness. And in the tacit tenderness of hearts thrown open each to each, we found the perfect peace that brings a foretaste of eternal things. I'm John Boyle. I'm a professor of theology. I'm also an inveterate and irregular reader of obituaries, especially the Times of London, famed for its obituaries. And in 2001, I read the obituary of Anne Reidler, of whom I had never heard. It turns out very few have heard of Anne Reidler, unless you're an English poet. Uh, she was a poet's poet, apparently. Uh, they all knew her, but within a small circle. And I, um, just the excerpts in the obituary were enough for me to fall in love. So it was only 2001. She died at 89 years old. She'd been writing poetry for 60 years. Her first collection was 1939. She loved the art form. She was, she liked the challenge of the, the, the craft of poetry. She liked translating 
libretti of Italian opera for the National Opera because she liked the challenge of both translation and music and poetry all together. What drew me to her is she's a poet in the metaphysical tradition, that wonderful English tradition of poetry. And, but she writes about very ordinary things. I had originally indicated a poem called Choosing a Name, but I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm going to do a different poem from the same collection called Before the Fall. I like this poem because although it's really about her son, it's also about my youngest. Before the Fall. Yes, the most excellent beauties come unearned. I think as I look at you, but quite unpaintable, unprintable, and alas, unmemorable too. The face which the camera fixes on a sheet, that smiling daisy face, becomes a changeling that memory rocks in the cradle in the living child's place. The look of a foreign child, the smell of a bonfire, will come to mind at a call, but not you, Sandhopper, builder of falling towers, whose beauty seems eternal. We shall know too many of you as time goes on to keep one image clear. A stranger would paint first the aureole of hay and spun glass hair, and then, coming to the imp's eyes, might pause. But still, for a little while, Glory and mischief agree together, and to cross the social will is a good joke, since nothing wholly divides you from the milk you spilt. And so, having no sense of separation, you have no sense of guilt. To glory in mischief, this is the happiness to which the lunatic and the criminal aspire, remembering that they were once adorable in all they did and felt the impartial fire. But you, urchin, hericon, with prickles of temper and restless trotting feet, can do outrageous things unblamed because your gazing self is lost in what it contemplates, like the seraphim that know, the cherubim that love, most. Well, we're moving right along. Um, thank you for inviting me again. I thought after last year I might not be invited ever again, and I'm Okay, here we go. Um, those of you who are here last year will probably remember that I like poems with a bit of anger in them. Uh, so here are two more. Um, in the early 1980s, there was a famous rape trial, or rather an infamous rape trial in the UK, at the end of which the presiding judge said that because the woman who had been raped uh, had been wearing revealing clothing, she was partly responsible for what had happened to her. Uh, and was guilty of what he termed contributory negligence, which I've since discovered is a l real legal term. Um, so this is a poem about an imaginary encounter between that judge uh, and a young man of a rather different social background. Uh, it's by the poet John Bain, who goes by the rather more interesting stage name of Attila the Stockbroker. Um, and the poem is called Contributory Negligence. Are there any Brits in the audience <laughs> to laugh at my fake London accent? No, okay. Hitching home last night at the M7, coming back from a Dexys gig, I got picked up about half eleven by this bloke in a funny wig. Flash Mercedes, new and gleaming, deep pile seats and deep seat piles. I sat in the back seat scheming while the fat cat flashed me smiles. He said he'd just come back from sessions with a bunch of ageing hacks. Said he'd given no concessions to the boot boys and the blacks. He said he thought that it was stupid, fuss about rapists on the news. The bloke was only playing Cupid, and girls like that, they don't refuse. 
He asked me if I thought he was enemy. Asked me if I bore a grudge. Told me that he came from Henley. He said he was a high court judge. I asked him to stop a second. Needed a pee, that's what I said. When he did, the anger beckoned and I smacked him in the head. Took his keys and stole his money. Crashed his car into a ditch. Though he moaned, they'll get you, sonny. I got away without a hitch. I don't think they'll ever find me, because I'm many miles away. But if one day they're right behind me, this is what I'm going to say. He asked for it. He's rich and snobbish, right-wing, racist, sexist too. Fat and ugly, sick and slobbish, should be locked in London Zoo. He wanted me to beat him up. It was an open invitation. Late at night he picked me up, transparent provocation. High court judges are a blight. They should stay home in nice warm beds. And if they must drive late at night, should never pick up Harlow Reds. A five pence fine is right and proper. And to sum up my defense, it was his fault that he came a cropper. Contributory negligence. Um, I was raised in the industrial north of England, and uh, up there in Manchester, there's a rather depressing suburb by the name of Salford, uh, which the locals call, for some reason, Chicken Town. I'm not quite sure why. Um, two of Salford's probably most famous old boys are the painter, Ellis Lowry, whose, whose landscapes of sort of matchstick figures walking through rather bleak uh, mill, satanic mill landscapes, you might know, uh, and the poet John Cooper Clarke. Um, John, in the early 1970s, when I was growing up, was affectionately known as the Bard of Salford. Uh, he didn't have a lot of affection for his hometown, as this poem reveals. Um, just one piece of English here that you might need to help you understand one line of the poem. Uh, in the second verse, surf is a brand of washing powder. Um, I should also tell you before I start that there are two published versions of this poem. One is X-rated. Uh, the other one is R-rated, uh, and for a, a nice American audience like yourselves, I'm going to read you the R-rated version. Um, but I just want to let you know that there is some bad language in it, um, so those of you who um, uh, have sensitive ears might want to avert them right now. Um, I'm not going to bowdlerize it, partly because I don't believe in that, and partly because the poem wouldn't rhyme if I did. So this is Evidently Chicken Town by John Cooper Clarke. The bloody cops are bloody keen to bloody keep it bloody clean. And the bloody chiefs are bloody swine who bloody draws the bloody line at bloody fun and bloody games. But the bloody kids he bloody blames are nowhere to be bloody found anywhere in Chicken Town. The bloody scene is bloody sad. The bloody news is bloody bad. The bloody weed is bloody turf. The bloody speed is bloody surf. The bloody folks are bloody daft. Don't make me bloody laugh. It bloody hurts to look around everywhere in Chicken Town. The bloody trains are bloody late. You bloody wait and bloody wait. You're bloody lost and bloody found, stuck in fucking chicken town. The bloody view is bloody vile for bloody miles and bloody miles. Bloody babies bloody cry. Bloody flowers bloody die. The bloody food is bloody muck. The bloody drains are bloody blocked. The color scheme is bloody brown everywhere in chicken town. The bloody pubs are bloody dull. The bloody clubs are bloody full of bloody girls and bloody guys with bloody murder in their eyes. A bloody bloke got bloody stabbed, waiting for a bloody cab. You bloody stay at bloody home, the bloody neighbors bloody moan. Keep the bloody racket down, this is bloody chicken town. The bloody trains are bloody late, you bloody wait and bloody wait. You're bloody lost and bloody found, stuck in fucking chicken town. The bloody pies are bloody old, the bloody chips are bloody cold. The bloody beer is bloody flat, the bloody flats have bloody rats. The bloody clocks are bloody wrong, the bloody days are bloody long. It bloody gets you bloody down. Evidently chicken town. Thank you. I'm Danny Roach and I work in the library and I knew that it was going to be rather difficult to follow Simon. So I am, uh, I, I was right. Um, I've had the good fortune of being um, able to participate in a number of artist residencies, and so when I am away on residencies, I'm often with other writers. And I'm going to read you a number of poems from writers uh, that I've encountered 
in Lake Forest, Illinois, and at the Malay Colony in upstate New York. And I wanted to read from regular folks who are just writing, um, being poets every day in their everyday life in the same way that um, I try to be a painter in mine. The first poem I'm reading is As Light Transcends Time, and it's by Meredith Treaty. And it's after a painting called The Woman Reading um, by Peter Jansen Zalenga. And he works very much in the style of Vermeer. My work, my uh, paintings are very much about moments in time. And um, this is very much about a moment in time, but it's also about the idea of a painting inside of a painting. In this case, it's a painting inside of a poem. Pale sun trickles through casement windows and spots a woman excuse me, and spots a desk where a woman sits and writes. She stares up at a postcard tucked between window pane and frame. The woman reading. In dim light, her face blinkered by a white Muslim cap, shoes kicked off in the painting's foreground. The painted woman sits for a stolen, submerged moment, drawn into the page away from the safe burger life she has scrubbed her way into. She reads away. The women sigh. The second poem I'm going to read is by um, S. Kirk Wall. She's a novelist, journalist. She writes for the New York Times and many other popular magazines. I was um, attracted to the imagery, the water imagery in this particular poem, on living. Lake Erie, 1971. There are fish, many of them, one in particular. He is long and thin with sharp phosphorescent teeth. Look at those teeth. A northern pike fish, the kind you find in these cold waters of Lake Erie. I'm not going to hurt you, he says without saying it. He continues to swim by, a leisurely Sunday swim in these familiar waters and there's a whirling gush of bubbles. She runs her hands through them, the bubbles dancing in between her glowing fingers. Then there's the nearby whine of the boat's propeller, a watery chop, chop, chop. And up she goes, pulling herself up like out of an enormous treetop, her legs and arms treading underneath the blue-green luminescence. He, the unreachable self in question, yanks her out of the water by her armpits in one forceful motion. He is scared, electric scared, oh my God scared, but not her. She is exhilarated by the rush of excitement. Everything is changing so quickly. One minute she is nothing, a particle, a speck, barely surfacing on his radar, hanging her legs over the boat's side, the cold, frothy waves licking the soles of her feet, the next minute, she is brave and strong. After all, she can swim and she's only five. And he is very, very worried about her welfare. Are those tears? The hum of the boat's motor vibrates against her ear and cheek. A wool blanket is swaddled around her small, naked body. In her mere five years of being living, she has never felt so safe. Her older sister crawls up right next to her a warm ball drawn against the curve of her back, vertebrae bending against vertebrae. They fall asleep together in the shallow space underneath the boat's bow. I am alive, she thinks without thinking it. I have never felt more alive. And Kirk introduced me to Marie Howe, and I just uh, saw my sister in Florida who has a seeing eye dog, and since this is a dog poem, came to the top of the list, Buddy. Andy sees us to the door, and Buddy is suddenly all over him, leaping and barking because Andy said, walk. Are you going to walk home, he said, to me. And Buddy thinks him and now, and he's wrong. <laughs> he doesn't understand the difference between sign and symbol like we do, the thing and the word for the thing how we can talk about something when it's not even there, without it actually happening, the way I talk about John. Andy meant soon. He meant me. As for Buddy, Andy meant later, when he was good and ready, he said. Buddy doesn't understand. He's in a state of agitation and grief, scratching at the door. 
If one of us said Andy when Andy wasn't there, that silly buddy would probably jump up barking and begin looking for him. I have one last poem um, entitled VIP Lounge, and I hope this makes a circle from Dan's opening poem, poem by um, Joyce Sutphin on the body. This is um, a poem by uh, Carol Stevens Nur, and it's about her mother's Alzheimer's. VIP Lounge. I walk down the corridor of this passenger terminal, every room a gate to the next destination. I find my mother studying her passport, reminding herself over and over who she was in 1974 when she took her last trip to Europe. Still loosely attached to hers by a tied together pair of new black shoelaces is my father's passport. I don't like that man's picture, she says. It's square and flat, it, it doesn't look like him. I ask if I may close the passports and tie them up again. Yes, she says, they belong together. Stuck into the mahogany frame of her old bedroom mirror where they interrupt her reflection are family snapshots. Accustomed now to the de delay in her departure, she has taken to playing solitaire with them. She fans them out, a full house of children and grandchildren all in one generation. Flesh and blood, I too, am familiar, but she can't place me. Her brother, his beak-nosed gaze keeping watch over her blue chips, her ancient Irish nurse in the closet murmuring Hail Marys, her parents playing Brahms, four hands on their twin baby grands are nowhere to be found. Perhaps they are practicing a fanfare for her arrival. Now she lays the pictures out in rows and talks to them. Daddy shirtless in his victory garden looking into the distance as if he were thinking up a palindrome. Herself at 40 on a family trip to the capital, her head wreathed in cherry blossoms. My sister and I in snowsuits, lugging an old Christmas tree to the trash. Her grandchildren in formal school portraits. Lowering her voice so they won't overhear, she tells me that she can't get them to eat their breakfast. I new to the language of this country, not as if I understand. The truth is, I've begun to feel homesick for my own living room where my husband sits reading, tapping the arm of his chair lightly with his thumb to the beat of Irish folk music. In any case, it doesn't matter whether or not I understand what she says. I have made arrangements to leave her under the watchful eye of an interpreter and guide who will come presently, bathe her papery skin, and put her to bed. In the morning, there will be another to help her up the steep ramp of tomorrow and every day after that until it's time for her to leave. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thanks for coming, readers. We really appreciate uh, your, your reading today. Great job, uh, everybody. Um, stay around for some treats. And remember, uh, next year, 10th anniversary is going to be very, very special. So thanks a lot.